Doug's a 1980 graduate of Randolph-Macon with a major in physics. Doug was also a center on our football team that won three ODAC championships during his time here. Um, Doug went on from Randolph-Macon to earn a uh, master's um, in mechanical engineering from Georgia Tech. And then from there, he went on to earn uh, an MBA from the Harvard Business School. After a successful career as a CEO and COO of several small businesses, Doug now works as a management consultant at Whitestone Partners, helping small business, businesses develop their infrastructure uh, to grow profitability. Doug is also the author of Let Go to Grow, Why Some Businesses Thrive and Others Fail to Reach Their Potential. This uh, Let Go to Grow was named the, the best business book of 2011 by the National Federation of Independent Businesses. Doug is also the author of Memoirs of a Yellow Jacket. And that's his story of his time here as a student athlete at Randolph-Macon. Both books are available in our bookstore. But for the past 10 years, Doug has served as a trustee to Randolph-Macon and, 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 and a true friend of the college. And, but, but perhaps most importantly, Doug is also the pr proud parent of two Randolph-Macon graduates. Mr. Doug White. Thank you very much. I appreciate the opportunity to speak with you this morning. I'd like to start off today with a question. What do you hope to get from an undergraduate education? You're getting ready to invest a, a four years of your life and a fair amount of money in getting an undergraduate education. So what do you hope to get out of that? Well, let me tell you something that I think you will not get. I do not think that you will master a body of material that someone will pay you for the rest of your life because you know. Now, I've got an example that sort of supports that point. You see, when I was a student at Randolph-Macon, one of the things I learned how to do was to program a computer. Now, you might think that's a pretty useful skill. Perhaps somebody would pay him for the rest of his life because he knows how to program a computer. Folks, I learned to program that computer with punch cards. <laughs> Most of you students don't know what punch cards are. Some of your parents may not know what punch cards are. The point is, there's not a lot of call for that these days. The world has moved on. In this very, very rapidly changing world in which we live, no matter what you study as an undergraduate, you're going to have to move beyond that to remain relevant. I'd like to suggest to you that what you can hope to take from an undergraduate education is three things. That you develop the ability to learn, that you develop the ability to think, and that you develop the ability to communicate. As David mentioned, I graduated from Randolph-Macon in 1980. That same year across this country, tens of thousands of young people graduated from college. Do you know that essentially none of them have failed to get their first job? Many have failed to see their careers advance the way that they might have liked. So I'd suggest to you that as an undergraduate student, one of the things that's terribly important is that you build the set of skills that will allow you to advance your career. You may or may not be preparing for a specific job, but you're preparing to develop a career. And it's those abilities to learn, think, and communicate that will enable you to do that. Now at Randolph-Macon, we help students develop those abilities through something called hand cultivation. Hand cultivation was a term that was coined by President Blackwell, the gentleman for whom this building is named. In our marketing literature today, you won't see that phrase. What you'll see is something called moments of connection. It's exactly the same thing. You see, both of these terms are referring to the one-on-one -on -one interaction that our students have with their professors, with their coaches, with staff members, with other students. It's about the connections that they make. It's about the relationships with the faculty. Hand cultivation. You see, our professor's primary job is to teach undergraduate students. There's no graduate programs to distract them. Yes, they do research, usually including undergraduate students in that research. But the focus, the reason that they're here, is to teach undergraduates. Now, I'll share with you a couple of examples of the hand cultivation that I received when I was a student here. So David mentioned I was a physics major, and therefore it won't surprise you to learn that the time came when we had to do our first physics lab. 
Professor Dr. Bill Hesse handed out a one and a half page paper and he explained to the class that we had essentially no chance of passing this lab if we did not read this paper. Uh, it was only a page and a half long, so everybody read it. It's about a guy named Galileo. Any of you heard that name before, Galileo? Pretty famous scientist. And it turns out Galileo was sitting in a church service. And I guess he wasn't paying much attention to what was going on with the minister because he was watching the chandelier swing. And it was one of the old chandeliers with candles and he started timing with his pulse how long it took that chandelier to swing from one side to the other and back. And when a pendulum swings from one side to the other and back, the time it takes to do that is called the period of a pendulum. And Galileo made an interesting observation using his pulse, which is the time that it took to go from one side to the other and back was the same when that pendulum was swinging through a wide angle fairly quickly as it was when it was moving more slowly but swinging through a smaller angle covering less distance. So he developed a hypothesis that the period of the pendulum is independent of the angle through which it swings. Okay, we all got that. In we go for our first lab. And sure enough, there are all of these pendulums set up around the lab on the tables and protractors for measuring angles and stopwatches for measuring time. You pair up with your lab partner and off you go and you start measuring different angles and how long it takes and you collect all the data and we make copies of it and off we go to write our labs up. Now the turnaround on this lab was very quick. It was due the following morning at nine o'clock. I think I probably started to write my lab up about 10 o'clock that night. And of course, you get to the point where we had to plot the period of the pendulum versus the angle. Now, being a bright young physics student, I knew what that plot was going to look like. Right? It's going to be a flat, straight line. It's got to be. Because the period doesn't change. The angle changes. The period is always the same. It's going to be a flat, straight line. OK. So I plot the first point. Great. Second point, looks good. Looks like a flat, straight line. Third point, right in line. We're in good shape. Fourth point, ooh. It's up a little. Okay, no problem, I can fudge that, we're good. Fifth point, up a little bit more. Sixth point, up just a little bit more than that. So where I know that I'm supposed to have a flat straight line, I've got a flat line that kind of curves up at the end. I had blown my first physics lab. Now folks, there were, you, know, you folks would not have a problem today because you'd be texting one another, you'd be emailing, you'd be back and forth. We didn't have that, right? We're alone. And, and we had to figure out how we were going to grapple with this situation. Now, there were three common responses to this problem. The first was falsify the data, <laughs> right? I mean, you know it's supposed to be a straight line, so you plot a straight line. Folks, in case any of you have a question, that is not the preferred response. The second approach is what I call the big dot approach. <laughs> you see, if you make the dots big enough, you can make a straight line. And you're not really cheating because the actual point is in that dot somewhere. At the beginning, it's at the bottom. At the end, it's at the top. But it's in there. And you can get your straight line. Then there was the third approach, which is the one I took. And I wrote my lab up. And I explained that we'd gotten the wrong answer. And then I came up with a series of hypotheses about what might have caused us to get that wrong answer. And I came up with some amazing thoughts. I'm pretty sure that the relative humidity in the room changed. <laughs> and it slowed that pendulum down. But if you want to know what it really was, what it really was, it was my lab partner. <laughs> I'm pretty sure his thumb got tired. And he didn't click that stopwatch quite quick quickly enough. And that's what caused our data to be out of line. Next morning at 9 o'clock, we go to class, we hand in our labs. Dr. Hesse assigns us a time. That's the time that each one of us are to come individually and sit in front of his desk while he grades our lab. Now, I don't know that any of our science faculty do that today, but when you have small classes, that's something you can do. I arrived at the appointed time, sat down in front of Dr. Hesse's desk, and he starts grading my lab. Everything's going pretty well. He's correcting spelling punctuation, grammar, none of which I think should be a physics professor's concern. <laughs> All of which is his concern. Remember that thing I mentioned about teaching you to communicate? Here's a physics professor teaching me to write. So he gets to the part about where 
we got, the, we got the wrong answer. And he looks at me and he says, so, Doug, you don't believe your data. And I said, uh, well, no, sir, I, I, I guess I don't believe my data. And he said, and what do you do when you don't believe your data? And I knew this was the wrong answer, but I didn't know what else to say. I said, blame your lab partner. <laughs> he said, no. You get your butt back in the lab, and you do it again. And if you still don't believe your data, you do it again. And you keep doing it until you do believe your data. Let me ask you a question, Doug. How did Galileo measure the period of that pendulum? Using his pulse. And how did you measure it? Using a stopwatch. And which of these two fine chronometers do you suppose is more accurate? Oh, okay, so what do you suppose to take away from this? Well, the first thing I took away was do not cheat on a Bill Hesse physics lab. He will find you out. But how about learning to think? Learning to think independently. Being willing to stand up for your findings even if it means challenging a famous scientist like Galileo. Wow. What a lesson to take away from a physics lab. Okay, fast forward to the end of that freshman physics school, end of first semester, freshman physics. Dr. Hesse finished a lecture one day, he looked at me and said, Doug, please join me in my office. Now, that did not seem like an optional request. So I went, he said, have a seat. I sat down in front of his desk, he looked at me and said, Doug, you're doing very well in this class. And if you do well on the final exam, you could aspire to an A, but son, if I hear you use the word ain't one more time, I'm going to fail you. Now, I solved that problem. I did not speak in his presence for the balance of the semester. <laughs> you see, I'd grown up in a rural environment. I'd worked a lot of construction. And although I knew how to speak proper English, my speech patterns were peppered with country colloquialisms and words like ain't. And sometimes I'd move right on to ain't got no. All of those sort of things came out of my mouth with some regularity. And Dr. Hesse put a stop to that. Years later, he became a, a, my mentor and my friend. Years later, I'd come back to school. I, I don't remember if I was in graduate school at the time or if I was out working, but I joined him in his house over on Mullen Drive on the back porch for a glass of iced tea. And I said, Bill, do you remember in freshman physics where you threatened to fail me if I used the word ain't? He said, oh, I remember very well. I said, you are a physics professor. Why on earth did you do that? He said, Doug, I saw you had potential. I thought you could go places. I thought you could maybe make it to the boardroom. But I knew you wouldn't get there the way you spoke. Oh, don't misunderstand me. You're always going to be able to go back with your high school buddies and speak good old boy, and that's fine. You'll never lose that but you gotta be able to turn it off. You gotta be able to communicate with people in the way in which they'd like to be communicated with. Physics professor teaching me to communicate. Okay, we move forward to my senior year. I've decided that I'm, I'm not gonna go on in physics. I'm gonna get a master's degree in mechanical engineering. I pretty much decided that I was gonna go to Georgia Tech. I had a couple of other offers still on the table and I happened to mention to Dr. Hesse that I was kinda nervous because I'm going to go off to Georgia Tech, I'm going to be competing against folks from Stanford and Caltech and MIT and all the big name engineering schools in the country. And I'm coming from this little bitty Randolph-Macon College. My degree is not even in engineering, it's in physics. And I'm going to go have to compete with these folks from these big name schools, these, these kids that were a whole lot smarter than I was. He said, Doug, you're going down to Atlanta next weekend, aren't you? Uh, you know, over spring break to, to visit? I said, yes, sir. He said, stop in the bookstore. Find the textbook that they use for their undergraduate sequence in mechanical engineering to teach thermodynamics. Buy that book and bring it back. Well, I knew Dr. Hesse well enough to know you don't challenge him on things like that. You just do it. So I said, yes, sir. When I was in Atlanta, I picked up the book. It's, uh, it's brown. It's about this thick. It's by a guy named Wark. It still sits on my bookshelf, much to my wife's dismay. He looked at it, flipped through the pages, said, okay, read the first chapter, work the problems in the back. I did that, came back a few days later with my work, showed it to him, he reviewed it quickly, looked at it and said, okay, 
read the second chapter, work the problems in the back. To make a long story short, Dr. Hesse spent hours, hours, working through that entire textbook with me. He wasn't a mechanical engineering professor, he was a physics professor. This wasn't his job, he was going above and beyond to make a point. Because when we got to the end of that book, he looked at me and said, Doug, I didn't teach this to you. There were no lectures, there were no labs. You work through this by yourself. Now, yes, we discussed things as colleagues would discuss them. We figured out how steam tables work together because neither of us knew. But you learned this on your own. You have learned how to learn. And with that, you can compete with anybody in this country. And he was so very, very right. You see, I went to Georgia Tech and later to Harvard. And what I found is that I was way better prepared than my colleagues who had gone to those large, big name schools. I had learned how to learn, think, and communicate through hand cultivation in a way that they'd not had the opportunity to do sitting in classes of two or 300 students. I finished in the top 10% of my class at Georgia Tech. I finished in the top 10% of my class at Harvard. Not because I was so darn smart, but because of the hand cultivation that I'd had here at Randolph-Macon. Because I had learned how to learn, how to think, and how to communicate. You know, I don't use many of the, many of the skills that I studied here at Randolph-Macon in physics in my day-to-day -day life. Bernoulli's principle, that's very interesting, and it's kind of nice that when I'm sitting on an airplane, I understand why that thing flies. But I don't really use Bernoulli's principle. Gauss's law, Legendre's polynomial, the second law of thermodynamics, all interesting things that I really don't use very much. But the one thing that I use every day of my life is the abilities to learn, think, and communicate that I developed through hand cultivation right here at Randolph-Macon. Folks, you face a very important decision where you're gonna spend the next four years of your life. I hope that you and your parents will figure out the place that's right for you, and wherever you end up, you'll have a very, very positive experience. I wish you all the best. Thank you very much.